we'd like to welcome you to our worship gathering this morning. We want to send out a special welcome to Reclamation Church. We're so glad you're able to be a part of our worship gathering as well. As we are adjusting to and actually beginning to enjoy the new normal, which is all around us, it actually gives us an opportunity to reflect. One of the things that I've thought about is that our building does not define us as a church. It's been so exciting for me to be able to see so many of you on mission. When I think of our gospel conversations, I realize that they are continuing to grow. We're currently at 3,197. We've sewn almost 500 face masks to distribute to those who are in need. We've sent out 22 large care baskets to our nursing friends who are serving on the front line. Some who are exercising are using that time to do a prayer walk around our hospital. Our building may be closed. Did you catch that? Our building may be closed, but we are not. Overflow is a church on mission to join God in his mission by inviting people to find hope in Jesus Christ. There are 290,000 people living in central PA who have no connection to a church. They have no relationship with Jesus Christ. And we believe that God has called us to be actively involved in seeing those numbers changed. And so, as your pastor, I want to say to you, stay on mission. Help us to continue to change those numbers. I wanted to encourage you all this morning to uh, check out our online uh, website. It's at lovealtuna.com. And there you can find not only information about what's going on here at Overflow and with our, in our church and our community, uh, but more specifically, uh, you can have the opportunity to join us in some online discussion groups. Uh, there's everything from the midweek discussion groups to uh, cafe time online uh, before the sermon on Sunday morning, as well as after the gathering, the worship gathering on Sunday morning as well. Uh, there are even times for your kids to join in and speak with other kids. My kids, every single Sunday, at least one or all six of them are on mingling with their friends and having a good time doing it. And then we also have the opportunity just to go a little bit deeper uh, in the discussion of God's Word, uh, both on Sunday mornings uh, prior to the 1030 worship gathering as well as after the 1030 a.m. worship gathering we can also there's a link there for the 1030 a.m. worship gathering and then throughout the week once again so we encourage you go to lovealtuna.com and uh, join us so we can still be in relationship even virtually if you're a foster parent an adoptive parent if you're a teacher or a counselor I would like to encourage you to check out the Empowered to Connect conference. This is a conference that would be very beneficial to you because it is going to provide for you the tools that you need to reach or work with children who have come from hard places. The conference itself has a registration fee of $15. Once you pay that $15, you'll receive a code. This code will allow you to watch it again and again or as much as you'd like to throughout the entire month of May. Let me encourage you to go to lovealtuna.com where you can register today for the Empowered to Connect conference. When it comes to giving, uh, there are a lot of things that we're doing to make sure that uh, the people of the Lord as well as our community is taken care of. Uh, your giving goes to good things that are happening here in the city and doing the work of the Lord here. Uh, it's not just going to, you know, the biggest smoke machines or, you know, the greatest lights and things along those lines. We are really serving our community. So I want to encourage you to keep on giving, even though we're in the social distancing time. We have three different ways that you can give. On the screen, you should find the first way is uh, to give online, lovealtuna.com. Second way is that you can give uh, in, in person via U.S. mail. 
And the third way is text to give. Uh, very simply put, you send your text message into the number they're listed on the screen, uh, and it'll give you a couple promptings to make it as easy peasy, lemon squeezy as possible. So keep on giving and know that the funds that you are investing are going to the work of the Lord in a very positive way to love our community. I'd like to invite you to join us for a time of prayer. I, as we get ready to pray, I realize that many of you have shared your personal request with me, and I'd just like for you to know that we have been praying for those requests, and we are believing that God will work in your individual situation. And so continue to have faith as you believe that God is going to answer, answer your prayer. Shall we pray together? Kind Heavenly Father, we come into your presence this morning, and as we do so, we want to take this opportunity to thank you for allowing us to join you on mission we realize, Father, that as I've mentioned just moments ago, many of our people are very active. We are on a stay-at-home order, but we have found ways of being active in building your church and your kingdom. And for that, I want to thank you for those individuals who are doing their part in making a difference in our community to change those numbers in our, in our county and in central Pennsylvania. Father, we think of the needs that are represented by our congregation and they are many, but we know, Lord, that you are able to be with every specific need. Those needs that we've prayed for just this week, I pray that your spirit would be with each individual and give the touch and help that is so desired. We also think of our community, and as we do so, we realize that there's a family who has lost their home to fire this week, and not only have they lost their home, but they've lost the life of an eight-year-old child. And I just pray that as the mom and dad are recovering in the Pittsburgh hospitals, I just pray that you would be with them and that you would give them the help that they need for their bodies to recover. But I also pray, Father, that you would be with them emotionally. Yes. I can't even begin to imagine what it would be like to lose a child in a condition such as this. But I just pray for each one of the family members. You know the need that's there, and I pray that you would be with them and give them strength during this time. We'd also like to pray for those nurses, the nursing uh, family that we have even here in our uh, congregation and throughout the community. We realize that they are on the front lines. They're putting themselves in a position where they could potentially get the virus, but we know that you are there and we're asking that you would keep them safe and that you would continue to make them a blessing. Yes. And Father, we realize that there are other individuals from our congregation who are working in the few stores that are open and available for the public. And I just pray that you would be with them and you would protect them as well. And in the process, I pray, Father, that you would help each and every one of us as your children to be your light and to be the extension of yourself. Because as we are being your hands and your feet and your heart, we are bringing hope to people. We are helping them to find hope in Jesus as their Savior. And I just pray that you would continue to bless us as your church, that we would do our part to build your church and your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to welcome you to Overflow Church again today. It's hard to believe that this is our eighth week gathering online. We have a lot to celebrate. We're celebrating uh, the launch of Reclamation Church. They've been meeting online in Coalport uh, since Easter Sunday. We're excited about what God is doing there through John and Maggie as they continue to say yes to God. Uh, many have been asking uh, what our plan is uh, as we uh, continue in this season of COVID-19. And I want you to know that we are developing a plan as a leadership team so that we are ready when the time comes to begin gathering. But I want to let you know uh, that we are following the governor's recommendations. On Friday, the governor announced that 24 counties would be moving from the red phase to what the governor is calling the yellow phase. Blair County is not one of those counties. Blair County will continue in the red phase, but I want you to know uh, that according to the governor's recommendations, even in the yellow phase, they are asking that uh, churches continue to use video technology and uh, limit groups to no more than 25 people. And so even as we enter into the yellow phase, uh, we're going to continue to gather 
online. I want to encourage you. I realize a lot of you have been watching us online, but you haven't participated in the Zoom calls right now. We talked uh, as a leadership team this week about what it would look like to begin gathering in our building uh, in under uh, strict social distancing rules. And, and one of the things that we discussed is one of our values at Overflow Church is relationship and being a church where kids love to come and participate. And we, we acknowledge that right now in this season, as we enter into the yellow phase, the best place that we can continue to develop relationships as a church family is through the use of Zoom. And so I want to encourage you, if you haven't already done so, join us for cafe time on uh, Sunday mornings from 9.30 to 10 and jump back on uh, to Zoom uh, at 10.30 for the sermon follow-up. These have been great opportunities for us to continue to connect with our church family. And I know we're not gathered in person, but it's been a huge lifeline as we continue to connect with our church family. So if you haven't done so, I want to encourage you to take that step this week and join us for the sermon follow-up discussion. I also want to remind you that those of you with kids, there is a Kid City lesson that's posted on YouTube and Facebook each Sunday at 9 a.m. and that there's actually a Zoom call, a Zoom room, uh, if you join the Zoom uh, call uh, that's just for Kid City, and they have a lesson and, and, and opportunity to connect with their friends. So I want to encourage you to use these opportunities. Connect with us uh, this week in Missional Community on Monday night or Wednesday night. Uh, but this is an opportunity for us to continue to connect with our church family. When I've talked to people and, and asked them what are the greatest needs they have, over and over, higher than medical issues and higher than financial hardship people have told me the need to be connected in this time of isolation and so i want to speak directly to you if you're there today and and you're experiencing loneliness because you've been isolated i want to encourage you zoom is an opportunity for you to connect with your church family Today, I'm excited that we are beginning a new series, a citywide sermon series with more than 10 churches across the city called Stronger Together. I've heard a lot over the last couple months about what it means to be together in this. And I want you to know, as the pastors began preparing for this sermon months ago, long before... Uh, COVID-19 was even on our radar. We had no idea just how timely this sermon series was going to be. But I'm excited to dive in to this topic over the next six weeks as we discuss what it looks like to be stronger together. We've already discovered over the last two months the benefits of being connected with the churches across our city. The pastors in our city have been doing prayer walks around UPMC Altoona, praying for God to, to move in our hospital. The, the, pa the churches across the city have been partnering together to bless the, the staff and patients at UPMC Altoona. We, churches have locked arms to provide food for those in need, and, and different churches in our city have, have adopted different schools in our city to, to write notes of encouragement to the teacher and staff. And the reality is, is that we are stronger together. If we're really going to see Blair County and the surrounding region encounter Jesus in a meaningful way, then we have to lock arms with the other churches in our city and in our region, knowing that we can't do what God has called us to do alone. Today, we're going to begin our series by looking at the topic of prayer. We are stronger together in prayer. We're going to be looking at Acts 12. And, and, and in just a few minutes, we're going to read from this passage. But before we do, I want to give you a little bit of background on what's going on in this passage. So Pentecost has happened. The church has begun to explode. It's spreading throughout the region of, of the Roman Empire. As persecution has broken out. Stephen has been martyred. But Paul, who, who was once the chief persecutor of the church, has now become a follower of Jesus. But he's not 
been sent out as a missionary. That's actually going to happen in Acts 13, the next chapter. But what we discover in Acts 12 is that while Paul has become a believer, the persecution against the church has not stopped. In fact, Acts 12 opens by telling us that Herod, who who had become a convert to Judaism and was very a very religious person uh, within the Jewish faith and was trying to gain favor within the religious community, had taken James, the Apostle James, prisoner and had him killed by the sword. And this greatly pleased the religious leaders of his day. And so what does King Herod do? He sends his Roman soldiers out and they arrest Peter. As you can imagine, this sets fear in the church. And in verse 6, verse 4 of Acts 12 says this, Then he imprisoned him, placing him under the guard of four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring Peter out for public trial after the Passover. But while Peter was in prison, the church prayed very earnestly for him. Did you catch that? It says something changed when Peter was arrested. The church gathered in homes across the city and began praying earnestly. What does it mean to pray earnestly? The King James Version translates this as to pray without ceasing. They gathered in their homes across the city, and they began praying without ceasing, praying for God to take notice of what was happening, because they knew that they were in a situation that unless God showed up, it was most likely that Peter was going to face the same death that James had experienced. Now, there's a few things that we need to understand as we look at this passage. And the first is is that God sees our struggles. God knows exactly what we are going through. And in his sovereignty, we see God working all throughout history. In fact, the entire Bible is an account of God working and interacting with humanity. As we read scripture, it's important for us to remember that we are not the main characters. The main character in this story is not Peter. It's not James. The main character in the story we're looking at right now is God. And we see a God who hears their prayers and a God who is very much aware of the struggle that they're in. Verse 6, where we pick up, says this, The night before Peter was placed on trial, he was asleep, fastened with chains between two soldiers. Others stood guard at the prison gate. Suddenly, there was a bright light in his cell, and an angel of the Lord stood before Peter. The angel struck him on the side to awaken him and said, Quick, get up. And the chains fell off of his wrist. Then the angel told him, Get dressed and put on your sandals. And he did. Now put on your coat and follow me, the angel ordered. So Peter left the cell following the angel, but all the time he thought it was a vision. He didn't realize it was actually happening. They passed the first and second guard post and came to the iron gate leading to the city. And this opened for them all by itself. So they passed through and started walking down the street, and then the angel suddenly left him. Peter finally came to his senses. It is really true, he said. The Lord was sent his angel and saved me from Herod and from what the Jewish leaders had planned to do to me. Now, do you see what's happening in this passage? Herod wasn't taking any chances. It was customary that that a prisoner might be uh, handcuffed to one Roman soldier, but in Peter's case, he had Peter handcuffed to two Roman soldiers. On each side, he's handcuffed to a Roman soldier, and there's more guards standing outside his cell, making sure that under no circumstances was Peter getting out. But God had other plans. 
But before we really look at the answered prayer that we see here, I think that there's something deeper going on in this passage that I want to make sure we don't miss. And that is that when the angel arrived to rescue Peter, he was sound asleep. Yes, he was sound asleep. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm handcuffed to two Roman guards and I know in the morning that most likely they're going to be uh, putting me to death, I'm probably not going to be sleeping because I'm going to be worried. At least that would be the normal human reaction. But one of the things that we see all through the book of Acts is an absolute peace even in the face of persecution. You see, one of the things that we can't miss when we look at this story is that Peter, Paul, James, John, all of the apostles, and the everyday believers, yes, everyday believers, not just the leaders, but the church, had come to a place that they were so surrendered to the call that God had placed on their life that they were willing to do whatever it was that God called them to, whether God stepped in and rescued them and whether he didn't. It didn't matter how God responded. They were going to respond in obedience. And I have to tell you as your pastor that sometimes I really struggle with the way Christians talk about prayer. Sometimes when you hear religious people talk about prayer, it, prayer is, is talked about in a very manipulative way. That, that if I pray, God has to do what I want him to do. And, and, and it would be very easy to read a passage like this and say, if, if you only pray, then God's going to rescue you. But the truth of the matter is, is that sometimes God does rescue. And sometimes, just as in James' story, God doesn't rescue. But that doesn't mean that God is not on the throne. I want to challenge us as a church that we've got to move beyond praying in a way that is telling God what to do. And we've got to continually pray in a way that's seeking the will of God. What does it look like to gather as the church across this region. I'm excited that multiple prayer gatherings have started on Zoom. There's one on Wednesday morning at 6.30. There's another one on Tuesday night at 8 p.m. that are just gathering to pray. Pray for God to move. But what does it look like to approach prayer more from the perspective that I want to hear from God? I, I want more than anything, I want to know God's will on a specific situation. Rather than telling God, this is what you have to do, what if we spent more time coming before God and saying, God, I surrender to you, to your will, and to your way. And I want you to be glorified. When I think of the surrendered life, I think of Romans 12, 1 and 2. And it says this, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be living and holy sacrifices, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God renew you into a new person by changing the way you think. And listen to this last part. Then you will know God's will for you which is good and pleasing and perfect. If you want to know God's will, surrender everything you have to him and allow him to begin to change you from the inside out. And I believe with certainty that each and every one of us can come to a place where we are completely confident and at peace in every situation. We might not have a heads up on what tomorrow is going to look like, but just like Peter I believe that we can all come to a place of peace as we pray, seeking God's will to know what obedience looks like 
in the moment. And when we come to a place like that in our walk with God, there's complete peace and joy because it doesn't matter how God responds. We know we are at the center of God's will, just like we see with Peter. But Peter's story doesn't end there. In verse 12, it says, When he realized this, he went to the home of Mary, the mother of John Mark, where many were gathered for prayer. He knocked at the door in the gate, and his servant girl named Rhoda came to open it. And when she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed. Instead of opening the door, she ran back inside and told everyone, Peter is standing at the door. You're out of your mind, they said. When she insisted, they decided it must be an angel. Meanwhile, Peter continued knocking. When they finally opened the door and saw him, they were amazed. He motioned for them to quiet down and told them how the Lord had led them out of prison. James, tell James and the other brothers what happened, he said. And then he went to another place. At dawn, there was a great commotion among the soldiers about what had happened to Peter. Herod Agrippa ordered a thorough search for him, and when he couldn't be found, Herod interrogated the guards and sentenced them to death. Afterwards, Herod left Judea and stayed in Caesarea for a while. Now, this week when the pastors were gathering to talk about the sermons that we were going to be preaching in our different churches, Pastor Matt Hornberger at 4th Street Church of God made the observation that sometimes our prayers, our answered prayers are knocking at our door. Have you ever found yourself like these believers? That you're praying for God to move in such a way, but you're not actually ready for God to answer that prayer. They were praying for God to move, but they didn't believe that God had answered their prayer. And, and they displayed that in many ways, they didn't even really believe that God was going to answer their prayer. They just didn't know what else to do. I want to challenge us that our prayers must be connected with faith. You see, faith is more than an intellectual belief that God has the ability to rescue someone like Peter. Faith is when our actions begin to display what we believe God is going to do. As we talk about th this theme of stronger together and, and praying, the pastors in our city have been praying uh, for over two years, every Sunday morning, for an awakening to take place in, in our region where, where people encounter God and every man, woman, and child has the opportunity to not only hear the gospel, but to respond to the gospel multiple times. We're praying for a move of God, and, and we've continually said that we're not measuring success by, by how many people gather on Sunday morning with us to pray, but what does it look like for, for this to mushroom and, and begin to spread out? And, and we love, as we continue to hear stories of, of more individuals gathering in their workplace and prayer groups that have started at uh, Norfolk Southern and at the bus garage and, and, and around the region at the school, and, and there's been multiple prayer groups that have begun popping up, and, and, and multiple discovery Bible studies that are happening around the region as people are saying yes to God. But this is what I want us to challenge us. Let's not just pray for an awakening. Let's live with faith that we actually believe it's going to happen. Let's not pray like this group in, in Jerusalem that was praying for Peter to be released but didn't believe it was going to happen. Let's get down on our knees and call out to God because we know that God's will is that every man, woman, and child in our region would have multiple opportunities to hear and respond to the gospel. We, we know that it's God's desire that they be restored in the right relationship with him. So we know what God wants to do. But let's not just pray for an awakening. Let's not just lock arms with other believers and other churches across our city. But let's get up off of our knees each and every day and live by faith, expecting to see God move? What does it look like to get down on our knees and pray, expecting to see God move? What does it look like, as I've already challenged, for us to, to pray until we come to a place of complete peace that we know God's will about a specific situation, 
and then actually live as if that will has already taken place, regardless of whether we see it now? What does it look like for us to begin living now as if an awakening has already started, even if, if those on the outside are looking in and they're saying, no, where is it? Will you join me and the churches and the pastors across the city in locking arms and, and be stronger together as we pray for an awakening and as we get up each day with the expectation that God is going to move? If you're new to Overflow and new to watching our videos, you can click on the link that's in the description of the video or it's going to be in the comments to fill out a guest card so that we can send you a gift. And if you're one of us, a regular attender, maybe at Overflow or a video attender, then you can still participate in the act of worship of giving. We still have the options to give online through our website, through text to give, and through mailing a check. And if you're new to us, we invite you to join our Zoom call afterwards that where we're going to discuss the sermon and how it impacted us. And if you're a regular attender, you're absolutely welcome to join us with that too. It's going to be right after this video ends. And you can find the link of that in the comments below as well. Have a great week.